All right, so now electrostatics, the theory of the electric force, and I'll give you some examples. These will be similar to some of the Lon Kappa problems. Suppose you have two charged particles uh, in an isolated system. The problem is to calculate the forces. So let's suppose we have two positive charges. Let's say Q1 is 1.2 coulombs and Q2 is 3.4 coulombs. And we'll locate Q1 at the origin of a coordinate system. So it's at the point 0, 0, 0 in three dimensions. I'm just drawing two dimensions here. The other charge, I guess this one is Q1, this one is Q2. The other charge is at 3, 2, 0. So the x coordinate is 3, the y coordinate is 2, the z coordinate is 0. And of course, these have to be distances, so we'll use meters as the distance. Then what's the force on particle 2? Or for that matter, what's the force on particle 1? In this interaction, the two forces are equal but opposite. So here's our problem. And let's start with the force on particle 2, exerted by the presence of the other particle. Well, F2 is Q1, Q2 over 4 pi epsilon 0, r hat over r squared. Uh, we wrote before K, Q1, Q2, Q1, Q2 over r squared. But we often write k in the form 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. k is called the Coulomb constant. Epsilon 0 is another constant called the permittivity. And in some cases, it's uh, conventional to use epsilon 0 instead of k. So let's write this as q1, q2 over 4 pi epsilon 0, r hat over r squared. Now r hat over r squared is r vector divided by r cubed. So this is r vector. r vector is the vector from in this case, q1 to q2. And that vector is x2 minus x1. And x1 is in fact 0, because the first particle is located at the origin. So it's really just x2 over r cubed. All right, so let's look at the various components of this. Let's look at F2x. There's going to be a force F, and it'll have an X component. So that's F2x, and a Y component. So that's F2y. So here's F2x, and here's F2y. Of course, f is a vector, so I write it with a, an arrow over it. f2x is not a vector. It's the x component of the vector. So I don't put an arrow over f2x or f2y. So we have this constant q1, q2 over 4 pi epsilon 0. And now x2, the x component of that is x2, divided by r cubed. 
because x1 vector is 0. Now x2 is 3. Well, 3 meters. And what about r? r is this distance. So if I look at this right triangle, it has x part is 3, y part is 2. The distance is the square root of 3 squared plus 2 squared. That's the square root of 13. So I have square root of 13 cubed. So that's 13 times the square root of 13. And the unit is meters cubed. Well, I have to keep track of the units. And if I put in Q1 its value, Q2 its value, I end up with 2.35 times 10 to the ninth newtons. It's a force, so the force unit should be newtons. You can check the units. Um, you have to use your calculator to do this, or better yet, use a computer program. Here's a little computer program to calculate this number. I give it the value of Q2 is 1.2, uh, Q1, Q2 is 3.4. Epsilon 0 has a value 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12 in standard units. And here is Q1, Q2, or 4 pi epsilon 0, 3 over 13 to the 3 halves power. 13 squared of 3. Here's the answer, 2.3, well, rounded off 2.35 times 10 to the ninth. Of course, that's a huge force. That's because I assumed that these two charges were, these two particles were very strongly charged. Charged as much as, or even more than, a full coulomb. You know, mostly uh, charge that you might produce in a laboratory would be a small fraction of a coulomb. And so forces would be small fractions of a newton. But just putting in standard units, we get this very large force. As for the y component, well, again, it'll be y over r cubed. y over r cubed, y2 over r cubed. So again, q1, q2 over 4 pi epsilon 0. y2 is 2, and r is again the square root of 13. So 2 over 13 square root of 13 meters cubed. And if you have a little computer program or you just use a calculator, you get 1.57 times 10 to the ninth newtons. So it's sort of off in this direction somehow. Well, I know it's directed away from the origin. That's how you would calculate F2. And you see how it's easily done if you use Cartesian coordinates. And so we never really have to calculate R hat. It's a little easier to just calculate r hat as x2 minus x1 divided by r, so then I end up with x2 minus x1 divided by r cubed. Well, that's f2. Now you could do f1 in the same way, but it's actually much easier. You can just say, well, f1 is the opposite of f2. That's the same magnitude, the opposite direction. Well, that first problem was very easy, that first example. Here's an example where we have three particles. And we have to use the superposition principle. Suppose I have three particles. I'll call them capital Q, capital negative Q, and little q. And I want to calculate the force on smaller particle Q. Well, there will be a repulsion from capital Q. So that will be a force in this direction. Actually, since the coordinates here are 3 and 3, the direction here is 45 degrees from the, from the x-axis. And there'll be an attraction to negative Q because unlike charges attract. So there'll be a force 
directly towards negative Q, that'll be in the negative Y direction. And that force will be somewhat larger than this force because Q and negative Q are closer together than Q and Q. And now the force I'm looking for, the force on the charge little Q, will be the sum of these two uh, vectors. So you know how you add vectors. You take the first vector, then you put the second vector, the tail of the second vector goes on the head of the first vector, and then you go down in the direction of the second vector. Well, you end up in some direction like this. Again, I have the three charges in the xy plane, so the force will be in the xy plane. There'll be an x component and a y component. So let's write out the force as the sum of these two forces. First of all, the repulsion from capital Q is QQ over 4 pi epsilon 0. And now we'll use this trick of writing the force as R vector divided by R cubed. Well, what's our vector? Well, it's 3, 3, 0. It's 3 in the x direction. It's 3 in the y direction. It's not in the z direction. So it's 3, 3, 0. Or it's 3i hat plus 3j hat. The i hat is the unit vector in the x direction. So there's i hat j hat is the unit vector in the j direction. So there's j hat. And I have, at the 45 degree angle, I have equal components. 3i hat plus 3j hat. And now what's r in this case? r in this case is the distance from positive q to little q. Well, looking at this right triangle here, r squared is 3 squared plus 3 squared. r squared is 18. So r is the square root of 18. And then r cubed will be the square root of 18 cubed. All right, that's the little red vector. Now I have the blue vector. No, this is the blue vector. That is in the negative y direction. I can write it this way, kq over 4 pi epsilon 0. No, k times minus q over 4 pi epsilon 0, because this charge is q, this charge is minus q, in the y direction. So it's times 3j hat, because the vector from negative q to q is 3, 3 meters, in the y direction, so it's 3j hat. And I should remember I'm using meters for the units here. So you see I end up with a negative direction. I end up with a direction minus j hat. It has the same magnitude, oh well, the same constant in front, qq over 4 pi epsilon 0, but it's in the minus j hat direction. Okay, now I had y over r cubed. What's r cubed for this case? Well, in this case, the distance is 3. So it's just 3 cubed. All right, so now you need a calculator. Uh, you, could com you could first compute the direction or the component in the x direction. So it would be 3 over the square root of 18 cubed. You get 0 .0, 0 0.0393 in the i hat direction. So that's the i hat part. And you know, you can just use a, a calculator, or if you have a computer program that'll calculate uh, products of numbers like, like Wolfram Alpha, 
probably the easiest, or Mathematica, which is just the same as Wolfram Alpha, only a little more powerful, or maybe Python, write a little Python program. We have this distance, which is a square root of 3 squared plus 3 squared. That's this first distance. And we have this second distance, which is just 3 squared, which is just the square root of 3 squared. It's just 3. So we have 3 times the square root of 2. I guess that's the square root of 18. And 3 as the two distances. And now we have 3 over d1 cubed for the x component of f1. And we have 3 over d1 cubed for the y component of f1. And we have 0 for the x component of f2. And we have minus 3 over d2 cubed for the y direction of f2. And now the components will be f1x plus f2x and f1y plus f2y. Well, those turn out to be 0 0.039 and minus 0 0.0718. And I haven't put in particular values for the charges, so whatever the charges are, in a long kappa, you'd probably be given values for the charges, and you'd have to calculate this constant times these coefficients. And you can see the direction. It has a positive x component, and it has a larger negative y component. So it's, it's more or less 0 0.04 in the x direction and minus 0 0.07 in the y direction. So it's down in this direction, as we anticipated. It's away from the charge capital Q, and it's towards the charge negative Q, which is downward. So it'll be, you know, it'll have a, both an X and a Y component. So there'll be a bunch of long kappa problems of this kind. And remember the trick. Write R hat over R squared as R vector over R cubed and use Cartesian coordinates. I hope you're taking notes, because if you take notes and you come up with a Lon Kappa problem similar to this, you can look back in your notes and see how this problem was solved, and then just remind yourself how to do the calculation, and then apply the same method to the Lon Kappa problem. So I've, I think when you watch these screencasts, you should have a notebook available and take notes, you know, Keep track of the calculation. Don't just listen to the calculation. That won't, that won't teach you much. But try to follow the calculation along. In fact, do it yourself as you go along. Or in any case, take notes so that you can uh, apply that to another problem. Of course, problems like this are also worked out in the textbook. So if you're using the book by Bauer and Westfall, uh, read through the chapter and look at example calculations. All right, now a third example, which uses superposition again and also integration. This is an example where you don't have point charges. You know, adding the forces from point charges, that's just a question of vector addition. That's pretty easy. But what if instead of point charges, you had a point and an object? So here's the problem we'll work out now. A rod with charge Q. So this rod has charge Q. And a particle with charge little q. What's the force on the particle? That's what we're trying to calculate. 
Well, you see, these aren't point charges. One of them is, but the other one is an object. So how are you going to get the force for the due to the uh, charge rod? And you know, in a Lon Kappa problem, you'd be given a value for Q. You might be told Q is two coulombs. And you'd be given a value for, for little Q. You might say Q is, let's say, one coulomb. And you also see the length of the rod. Well, you see from the figure, the length of the rod is three meters. And the position of the charge. The charge is two meters from the end of the rod. So the rod goes from the origin to the point three zero. Charge Q is at the point three two. This is explained in the textbook by Bauer and Westfall in section 22.5. So read that section carefully and follow this calculation here. Here's the idea. To calculate the force due to a charged object, which is also called a distribution of charge. So section 22.5 is called distributions of charge. We have to use integration. We divide the object into many small parts. So take this, take this rod. So here's the rod and divide it up into many parts. I just divided it into small pieces. And I can consider each piece to be a particle. So this little section here, and I want to calculate the force on Q. Well, this little section here exerts a force on Q in that direction, in the direction from this point. So here's a little section of the rod. I could call that dq, little, little piece of the rod. And I'll treat that as a particle. Because if I make the sections very small, then each section can just be considered to be a particle. In other words, I'm dividing the rod into an infinite number of infinitesimal parts. Divide the object into many small parts and consider those to be particles. And then add the forces on the charge that I'm considering, Q, exerted by all the particles. Well, you know what happens when you add an infinite number of infinitesimal pieces. It's an integral. So this will become an integral. For the little charge segment, dq, the force would be 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, q times dq over r squared. Well, I have to have a direction. So I should have written here times r hat. And r hat will be different for each part of the rod. So I have 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, q dq r hat over r squared. Now again, we're going to make life easier if we write this as r over r cubed. So r vector divided by r cubed. Now r is this vector from the point dq to the point q. So this is r vector. It has, well, let's put it over here. Here is r vector. It's the vector from this point 
which I could call x prime, to this point, which I could call x. It's x minus x prime. Where x is the position vector of q, so in this coordinate system, that's 3i hat plus 2j hat. And oops, this should be x prime. x prime is the position vector of this little piece of the rod, which is on the x-axis. So x prime will just be the coordinate on the x-axis, that's x prime, i hat, x prime zero, zero. All right, so now r over r cubed is x minus x prime times i hat plus y minus y prime times j hat. And what's r? Well, it's, by the Pythagorean theorem, it's x minus x prime squared plus y minus y prime squared. So it's x minus x prime squared plus y minus y prime squared, square root to get r, cubed to get r cubed. So it's x minus x prime squared plus y minus y prime squared to the 3 halves power. I hope you're taking notes and trying to follow along in this calculation because you'll have to do similar calculations on the homework problems. Now, what's dq? A little amount of charge here, or the middle little amount of charge here. Well, dq is the charge density, lambda, dx prime. So we introduce a charge density, the charge per unit length along the x-axis. Call it lambda. Lambda is dq divided by dl. It's the small amount of, it's the ratio of a small amount of charge divided by a small length along the axis. Now if the charge is uniformly distributed, then that's the same as q divided by l. Just the total charge q divided by the total length l. If this distribution were different at different points along the x-axis, then it would be a more difficult calculation. But for a uniform charge rod, um, dq over dl, <coughs> the ratio of charge divided by length for a little section, is just the same as q over l. So dq is lambda dx prime, or q over l dx prime. So you see, I replaced dq by dx prime times lambda. The lambda I took to be constant, so I can pull it outside the integral. Q is also constant. It doesn't depend on the position on the integral. It just depends on this charge. So I can bring out the constants, q lambda divided by 4 pi epsilon 0. Then I have integral dx prime, r over r cubed. Now, this is an integral, so I have to have endpoints. So what are the endpoints on x prime? Well, x prime goes from 0 to 3. Or let's call this the length of the rod. So x prime goes from 0 to L. L is equal to 3. So it's just reduced to an integral. Well, actually two integrals. You have to do the integral for i hat and the integral for j hat. I'll do the x component of f. Remember, I had q lambda over 4 pi epsilon 0. I had the integral from 0 to l, that's 0 to 3, dx prime. The x component was x minus x prime, that's 3 minus x prime, over x minus x prime squared plus y minus y prime squared. But remember, y prime was 0. And y the y component of the charge q. So I have this 
rod and I had this point, this point was three, this point was two. So y is two, y prime is zero because the rod is down on the x-axis. Put it down here on the x-axis. So I have the integral 0 to 3 dx prime, 3 minus x prime over 3 minus x prime squared plus 2 squared to the 3 halves power. That's r over r cubed. Or rather, since it's the x component, that's x over x cubed. All right, so it's just an integral. Well, that's just math. Lambda was q over l. This turns out to be 1 half minus 1 over the square root of 13. How do you do an integral? Um, this integral is not so difficult. This integral is not very difficult. But rather than do the integral by hand, by figuring out the, the antiderivative, there is an easier way. And that's to use a computer to get the integral, or a computer program. The easy way to calculate an integral is to use Wolfram Alpha, or better yet, Mathematica, which is equivalent to Wolfram Alpha, only more, more powerful. So here's a little calculation, a little calculation to do the integral. This is using Mathematica, but you could type this into Wolfram Alpha. If you just type this into Wolfram Alpha, you'll, you'll also be able to get this answer. We want to do some integral. We want to integrate 3 minus x prime divided by the square root of 3 minus x prime squared plus 4 cubed. And we integrate with respect to x prime. Well, here's the answer. That's the antiderivative. But that's not the final answer. We have to evaluate the antiderivative at the endpoints. So at 0 and at 3. So we have this integral. We replace x prime by 3. And we replace x prime by 0. When I put x prime equal to 3, I get a half. When I put x prime equal to 0, I get 1 over the square root of 13. And the integral is this endpoint minus this endpoint. So I guess this endpoint gave me a half. This endpoint gave me 1 over the square root of 13. So I have 1 half minus 1 over the square root of 13. Now, if this were a long kappa problem, you'd probably be given values for q and q. You know the value of epsilon zero, you would plug in the numbers, you could use a calculator to calculate this number. Remember that I'm using standard units, so the, the final unit will be newtons. You could check the units. And that's fx. You're not quite done yet, because you still have to do fy. Well, I'll leave that as an exercise for you. Again, practice using Wolfram Alpha on this integral, where in the numerator here I would have y minus y prime. y is 2. Uh, y prime is 0. So I would have 2 in the numerator. So I'd just have dx prime over 3 minus x prime squared plus 4 to the 3 halves power. That, it turns out, is an elementary integral, but a difficult integral. But you can get it almost immediately from Wolfram Alpha. Well, that's the uh, end of part two of the screencast. Now go and start trying to do... Oh, by the way, there are calculations exactly like this in the textbook. In the section on distributions of charge. So you can also get some... Uh, get some instruction from reading the textbook. But go on now to the long kappa problems and see if you can do the long kappa problems.